righteousness. This one word can stir strong emotion and generate considerable controversy. You only need to hear political pundits for a short time to feel the rage caused by this one simple word, righteousness. This one word is drenched in blood and misery. Armies have marched across the world in pursuit of righteousness. Suicide bombers kill innocent women and children in the elusive pursuit of righteousness. Righteousness is something you and your social group have, but your political opponents lack. Just take a walk through history, and you will see that whoever controls the concept of righteousness controls the people. Nearly all totalitarian governments stay in power, not so much by the force of arms, but by the control of social righteousness. Political correctness seen in the political processes of today is nothing more than an attempt by one political opinion to control the thinking of the masses. The Christian Church has also entered the debate. One denomination views their doctrinal position more important and divine than other religious denominations. It is so easy to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ to be in doctrinal error because they do not agree with our dogmatic opinion. This kind of thinking is nothing more than political correctness given a religious spin. We now come to the crux of the issue. What is true spiritual righteousness? How we answer this question will reveal the true spiritual awareness that controls our lives. Since the concept of Christian righteousness is presented in the Bible, then what does the Bible teach about righteousness? Is true Christian righteousness anchored in right doctrinal opinion? Or is true spiritual righteousness much, much more? We need a new heart. According to Jeremiah the prophet, our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. King David and the Apostle Paul echoed these same sentiments when they wrote that there is no person righteous, not even one. We must understand that when humanity is measured against the purity and righteousness found in God, we are altogether evil and self-seeking. No matter how we robe our basic human nature, it is evil and self-centered. We might clothe our selfish motives in noble religious actions and good deeds, but the source of our righteousness is ourself. Much that is called righteous today is self-righteousness robed in pious religious rhetoric. No matter how you frame the picture, the basic heart of humanity is self-absorbed. We do need a new heart. God understood the problem. Humanity is corrupt with selfish ambition, vanity, and empty human pride. There is none that do good, no, not even one. Without a new heart, all human flesh would die 
without knowing God. The Apostle Paul wrote that, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In the midst of this boiling cauldron of human arrogance, God sent His Son, Jesus, into the world in order to open a path to the righteousness found in Himself. This path can only be found in the blood and pain of Calvary. There is so much in our lives we think is righteous, but is it? We might think that noble actions and good deeds manifest the righteousness that governs our lives. But we would be missing the true purpose for the righteousness of God. What is true righteousness? The best way to answer this question is to say what true righteousness is not. It is not good conduct or right theological thinking. Righteousness is not our personal view of morality or our own sense of justice. True spiritual righteousness is the essence and nature of God. It is God. Right action and right thoughts are only the byproducts of God's Spirit residing in our hearts. Paul wanted his readers to see that Jesus is the source of this new righteousness, and a process of being conformed to this righteousness is open to them. Our goal as a Christian is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not entering the pearly gates of heaven. Now we come to the crux of the problem. Why do we need the righteousness of Christ? The answer is simple. We have none of our own. How true are the writings of the Apostle Paul? There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. True spiritual righteousness is totally void from our base human character. Because of the fall of Adam, we are born dead to the true Spirit of God. Adam was our prototype in spiritual design. He was created with a body, soul, and spirit as we are. His sin brought death to his spirit man. Therefore, Adam no longer could walk with God in spirit. As Adam was our prototype in design, he is also our prototype in death. In order for us to walk with God in spirit, we must come alive in spirit. A new birth is needed. In simple terms, we must be born again. Being born again is much more than adherence to the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Being born again is having a new spiritual life infused into our dead human spirit. Why should I be concerned about this born-again experience? To answer this question, we return to the first chapters of the book of Genesis and discover why God created Adam to be a living soul. Why was Adam made with a body, soul, and spirit? The answer to this question is the root of why a born-again experience is needed. God made Adam to be a dual-dimensional being with the ability to walk in two dimensions 
at one time. His physical body could walk in the physical Eden on planet Earth, while his spiritual body walked with God in his garden. The soul was created by God to receive stimulus from both bodies at one time. Adam's soul was like a central processing unit in a computer that processes data from various input-output ports. Our physical body has five senses that we use to receive data from our physical surroundings, while our spiritual body also has five senses used to receive data from the spiritual dimension. All went well for Adam until he broke fellowship with God and sinned. Death came immediately, and Adam died to the spiritual dimension of God. He lost access to the spirit and became one-dimensional. It is so important we understand that death is not oblivion. It is separation. The spirit man of Adam did not cease to exist, but the life of God could no longer be found resident in his spirit. Adam became separated from God. As long as Adam lived, his soul received stimulus from his physical body. But death was all that could be experienced from his spiritual man. All the descendants of Adam have one thing in common. We are born spiritually dead. A new birth is needed should we desire to walk with God. For this very reason, Jesus came to pay the price for sin and open the door to a new spiritual life. When we embrace the born-again experience offered by Jesus, we allow the Holy Spirit to resurrect new spiritual life in our dead spiritual bodies. The Apostle Peter referred to this action as becoming partakers of the divine nature, while the Apostle Paul wrote that God gave to each born-again believer the measure of faith. The new life imputed into our human spirit is the spark of God's own divine nature. It is His essence. It is His spirit. It is His righteousness. This imputed righteousness of Christ is much more than God having a favorable opinion. The righteousness of Christ is the divine nature of Jesus. It's the measure of faith we all receive at new birth. Consider this thought with me. We have resident in us a deposit of God's divine nature. We might associate God's divine nature to spiritual DNA. The DNA code of His divine nature has total redemptive power and it has a mission and purpose in the covenant of the New Testament. The will of God is part of his divine DNA, and coded into God's divine DNA are the fruits of righteousness that will transform our lives. All that we can be in God is coded into his divine DNA. But DNA coding is not a guarantee. It's only a path that could be followed. For example, should a person have a DNA propensity to be an alcoholic, that is no guarantee of a life of alcoholism. This person still must take the first drink. We must act upon our DNA instincts before this coding can influence our lives. Should we desire to know the will of God, 
then we must allow His divine DNA to mature and influence our lives. This type of maturing process can only occur through obedience and intimate relationship with God. Let's pose two questions. Since we are the beneficiaries of such a great gift as Christ's righteousness, then why are we such a frustrated group of believers? Where is the power of this imputed righteousness? The answer to these two questions is simple but difficult to act upon. We must become aware of the divine nature resident in us. In simple terms, we must wake up. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Paul understood that we must awaken to the divine nature within us and stop frustrating the awakening process with our sin. It is interesting to note that the Greek word used by Paul does not have the application of waking up from a good night's sleep, but it means to sober up out of a drunken stupor. There is an implied truth in this definition, that spiritual drunkenness can frustrate the manifestation of God's righteousness in our lives. The Bible has much to say about spiritual drunkenness. It is a deep hunger to be consumed with the cares and lusts of this world through self-gratification and the drive for world acceptance and identification. Simply stated, spiritual drunkenness is many things, but world conformity and self-gratification are its two main roots. Christians must realize that our love for comfort and for the things of this world is frustrating our ability to awaken to Christ's imputed righteousness. We honestly don't realize the risks we take by pampering our lusts and self-indulgence. Our spiritual drunkenness is robbing us of our ability to stand before the Son of Man and escape the horrors that are coming upon the earth. We have a paradox. When we become born again, we become two-dimensional once again, and we are partakers of the divine nature, but we are so ignorant of the things of God. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, provided the answer to our paradox. There is a great difference between the imputed righteousness received at new birth and the revealed righteousness working in our lives. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul wanted his readers to understand that true spiritual righteousness must go through a revealing process. This process is not a one-time confession of faith, but it's a continual experience growing in us through a maturing faith. The Greek word for reveal used by Paul is interesting and unique. It has the application of removing the cover to lay open what has been veiled or covered. To remove the cover from an item is to expose its hidden contents. During birthdays and at Christmas, 
we joyfully take our gifts and remove the wrappings to expose their hidden contents. Ponder for a moment the possibility that our imputed righteousness is the hidden contents within our spiritual person. Does the fact that Christ's righteousness is hidden diminish its power and ability to redeem, transform, and save? No, a hundred times no. However, the fact still remains our imputed righteousness is hidden in us. And it's our responsibility to allow the Holy Spirit to remove the cover and reveal Christ in our lives. Paul also wrote to the Corinthian church about this principle. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul, in his second epistle to the Corinthian church, wanted his readers to understand that the revealing process was a progressive revelation of the nature and image of Jesus Christ with ever-increasing glory and righteousness. Now we come to the crux of the matter. What is the thing that veils our imputed righteousness? We will look at this concept in Episode 2. Righteousness, a word that generates considerable emotion and opinion. Does your concept of righteousness coincide with the righteous judgment seen in the life and actions of Jesus? Or is your righteousness based more on appearance? Should God's view of righteousness be only right moral action or social justice? then we are the most miserable of all people because we have a righteousness that is subject to manipulation and political control. God's righteousness must be much, much more. Ask yourself one question. What moral ethic do you use to justify your righteousness? Does your righteousness change depending on the situation or circumstances? Should you say that your righteousness is based on your own personal morality? Then your morality has no foundation and will drift with the ebb and tide of political change. Should you say that your moral righteousness grows out of your religious belief or the Bible? I would say yes and amen. But be careful with this idea, because nearly all people use religion or the Bible to some degree to justify their opinion of righteousness. Countless charlatans have been seen in history manipulating the Bible with bloody consequences. Yes, true righteousness must be based upon the Bible, but it must also include an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Stop and think. What is the root of your concept of righteousness? <laughs>